Hi everyone, this is Tim, your Block 1 Lecture Instructor, and today we're going to cover Chapter 25, which is uh, Stress and Adaptation. And the learning outcomes for this chapter are, uh, the first one is Define Stress, Explain the Difference Between Adaptive and Maladaptive Coping Strategies, Explain the Relationship Between Stressors, Responses, and Adaptation, Describe Physical Changes that Occur During the Three Stages of the um, general adaptation syndrome. I believe it's pronounced Seeley's, um, but I'm not quite sure. Um, so we'll discuss that. We'll discuss the inflammatory response, uh, what triggers it and what physiological changes occur. Explain how anxiety, fear, and anger relates to stress. Describe the effects of prolonged stress and unsuccessful adaptation on the various body systems. Compare and contrast crisis and burnout. And finally, describe several interventions or activities for preventing and managing stress. So, what is stress? Um, it's any disturbance in a person's normal balanced state. It's a unique response by each person to a stressor and can be harmful or motivating. So, a stressor is a uh, stimulus that the person perceives as a challenge or a threat, and it initiates a physical or emotional response. A coping response is aimed at restoring um, and balancing and um, creating homeostasis. Adaptations is the changes that take place as a result of stress and coping. And homeostasis is to maintain um, external and internal equilibrium. So there are categories of stress. Um, the first one is distress. There's eustress and there's developmental stress. With distress, uh, this threatens someone's health. Um, it could be, um, let's say, use the example of divorce. Uh, with you stress, it's good stress, so that could possibly be uh, marriage. So with um, trying to um, um, get ready and um, organize and get, you know, prepare for a large wedding, that's good stress because you know there's going to be a good outcome. Uh, with distress, like I said, with um, years of marriage and things not working well um, and getting divorced, that's your distress. Um, so I also uh, found the example of raising children. Um, it's it's good stress because you're raising them, but then you're having this constant um, um, teaching and um, battle between you know adolescents and um, teenage years and the parents and all other stuff. So it's kind of a good stress but bad stress. And then there's also nursing school. Um, you know you guys are. Um, probably very anxious and having a lot of stress trying to um, have a family, raise your kids and still go to school or go to school and work at the same time. Um, the distress is the fact that it's constantly happening, but the, your stress is the actual good stress. You know, you'll take a test and you'll stress out about it and you'll have high anxiety, but then you get that A and then, then you get the good stress. So uh, with developmental stress, um, it's growing up or life uh, changes. Um, so as you go from being, let's say, 12, 13 years old to becoming a teenager, um, the stresses that come with that um, uh, is just part of, of life and life stages. So it's deve developmentally um, stressing you out. So there's situational, there's uh, physiological and psychological. Um, with physiological, it could be chemical, uh, physical or mechanical, nutritional, biological, genetic, and your lifestyle. And with psychosocial, it could be work, family, school, um, etc. So here's a clicker check. Um, the hospitalized client states, I need to know when I'm going to be discharged. I'm so upset and worried that I'm missing work. The nurse knows this is an example of eustress and no intervention is necessary. This is an example of psychological stress and the client would be placed on antidepressants. This is an example of developmental stress and the client should talk to someone his own age. And this is an example of distress and could affect the client's health status. And the answer is going to be D. The client's statement indicates that he is experiencing distress. Even though it could be uh, termed psychological, um, it would be inappropriate to simply place the client on antidepressant therapy without gathering more data. So dealing with stress and coping strategies. There's three general approaches for coping, depending on the situation. Um, coping strategies are thinking processes and behaviors a person uses to manage stress. Um, for alter, um, it's going to be removing or changing. For um, adapting to the stressor, um, it's changing your thoughts and behavior. 
um, and then to avoid the stressor, um, you're actually ending the problem. So styles of coping strategies, there's adaptive. Um, this is making healthy choices and reducing negative effects. And there's maladaptive, uh, which may relieve anxiety but has other harmful effects. Um, unhealthy uh, style or temporary fix. Uh, possible other harmful effects could be substance abuse and overeating. So um, let's, I mean, for lack of a better example, let's say that uh, your uh, patient is a cocaine addict and um, he wants to get off of cocaine, so he switches to crack. Um, so you're, you're able to adapt to one problem, but you just really created another or you create, changed one bad habit for another. And it's, again, it's just bad adaptation. So adaptation is a possible desired outcome of stress. It involves adjusting to the stress or the stressor and allows for normal growth and development and effective responses to life changes. So an example of this could be uh, nursing school. Nursing school is stressful, uh, but you adapt and you change and you grow from this experience. Um, so this would be um, a positive adaptation. So um, adaptation is also the ability to adapt, uh, which depends on the intensity of the stressor, the effectiveness of coping skills, and personal factors. So as you can see in this picture, um, for the uh, the stress, it's ba you ad adapt to the problem based on the available support that you may have, your coping, coping abilities and your experience, and then the, um, the number and duration of the uh, stressor itself. So let's just say that uh, with nursing school, um, we know that it's very stressful and uh, you're going to have high anxiety. Um, but if you learn to cope with the stress and learn how to manage it and have available support, then you have homeostasis because your uh, stress and anxiety actually is balanced out. Um, if you don't have much support or you don't have um, the ability to cope very well, then your stressors seem to be much bigger and then it also tips the scale. So you don't have uh, homeostasis. So factors that influence adaptation, um, there's the personal perception of the stressor, um, is understanding of the stressor realistic, and how successful have previous adaptation attempts been? And then you also have overall health status. The number of illness presented um, and the chronicity of the illness may affect the ability to adapt to a new stressor. So we have perception of the stressor, which may be realistic or exaggerated. You have overall health status. So if the patient has one disease, you may be able to easily adjust to it. If the patient has several diseases, the patient may be too overwhelmed to be able to adjust to it because they're dealing with too many other problems. And then there's also hardiness. Um, some people thrive on stressors. Um, myself, I um, do really well under pressure and last minute problems and being able to take care of them. I stress out a lot, but I also know how to deal with those stressors. And like I said, I also thrive based on that stress. So um, hardiness is being able to um, do very well in um, you know, urgent situations and, and problems. So um, again, you need a support system. I um, mean, family, friends, um, some sort of emotional support, uh, financial support, support helps, and physical help. Um, strong support is better adaptation. So if you, um, you know, those of you who are going through nursing school and have uh, children or large families, if they're able to help you and, and help raise the kids and kind of help organize your time, then the strong support that you have allows you to adjust um, to the uh, the stress. Uh, so for personal factors, uh, there's age, developmental level, and life experiences. Um, someone who is, let's say, 18 years old um, is going to probably not be able to adapt as well as someone who is 50 or 60 years old. Um, they've been through the trials and tribulations of life and um, have been through some things before. So that's that's where the wisdom and the, the, uh, the years come into effect and it allows people to adjust, adjust to those things. So with the general adaptation syndrome, um, the theor theoretical model of psychological responses to stress, it's non-specific body responses shared by all people, response to stress as well as uterus, and involves three stages. You can find uh, this picture in the, um, the start of the uh, explanation of the general adaptation syndrome. Um, the first one is going to be fight or flight. 
or the alarm stage. This involves involuntary body responses. Um, so you have the endocrine system and then you have the sympathetic nervous system. And you also have uh, the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, metabolic, urinary, gastrointestinal, muscle skeletal. So it, it encompasses all of the body systems. Um, I learned that with the fight or flight response, it's like being chased by a lion. Um, you know, you have the fear, you have the anxiety, um, you, you have to fight or flight to, to respond and, and save yourself from the, the tiger. So um, as you see with all these systems, this is what um, allows you to uh, either to run or to fight. So you also have the resistance stage. The goal is to uh, maintain homeostasis. This involves uh, the use of coping mechanisms, whether it be psychological um, or physical. Uh, it returns your vital signs to normal. And failure to adapt to or contain stress leads to a third phase. Your failure to adapt um, to uh, stress will lead to exhaustion. Um, if adaptive mechanisms become ineffective or non-existent, um, you have a decreased blood pressure, you have elevated pulse, and elevated respirations, uh, which usually ends in disease or death. So let's just say you're being chased by a, a lion or a tiger, and you know your body kicks into that fight or flight mode, and you run. You can only run for so long until your body just can't adapt to that stress anymore. Um, at that point, you either stop, <laughs> and the lion gets you, and you die. Um, but in a better scenario um, let's take the common cold or the flu um, at some point during these blocks you will get sick uh, whether it be the cold or the flu because you will be um, trying to study trying to raise a family trying to work trying to go to school try to do all these things your body will keep up for so long until it no longer can actually keep up once it can't keep up then your immune system runs down and at that point something's got to give and most of the time, it's you getting the cold or the flu. Um, it, you'll sleep for five days and you'll get better. It's your body's way of telling you to slow down. So with exhaustion, it's the exact same thing. And you have the recovery stage, which is the adaptation is successful. So you get the flu, you sleep for five days, you get better, and there's your success. So for a clicker check, a client who is taking the drug atenolol may not exhibit the expected rise in blood pressure and pulse during the alarm stage of general abdipation syndrome. And that answer is going to be true. Atenolol is classified as a beta-blocking beta agent by preventing epinephrine from binding to beta receptors. Um, this drug will actually mask or lessen the cardiovascular response during the alarm stage. Um, atenolol is meant to... Um, it's designed that, you know, your blood pressure goes up, but the drug is to keep your blood pressure from going up. So for the flight or fight response, the drug is keeping you from um, not necessarily fighting or flighting, but it's just keeping your blood pressure uh, stable. So physical responses to stressors, uh, there's local adaptation syndrome. This is a response to stress involving specific body parts, tissues, or organs. It's short-term attempt to restore homeostasis. It becomes localized, and it could be two different types. You have reflex pain and inflammatory pain or response. So an example of reflex pain would be being burned. Um, you touch a hot stove, and you feel pain, and your reflex is to pull away your, your hand or your arm. The inflammatory response is the local reaction to the cell injury. So you put your hand on a hot stove, your reflex is to pull it away, um, but you've been burned, so the inflammation will start and you'll start to be getting blisters and, um, and the burn will, will you know, respond to that. Uh, you will then have vascular response, cellular response, uh, the exudate formation, and then you'll actually begin to heal, uh, regenerate, and actually repair. So, uh, you touch a hot stove, you pull your arm away, you've got the burn, your body in, starts to take care of that uh, specific problem, and then at, over time it will actually heal, and then it repairs itself. So psychological responses to stress includes feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. There's anxiety and fear. There's ego defense mechanisms, which is denial, rational, rationalization, and projection, and anger and depression. So with anxiety, it's a vague, uneasy feeling and discomfort. 
It's not a response to danger, but to anticipation. Fear is an emotional feeling from an, un, uh, from an identified danger, threat, or pain. So fear is a cognitive response and anxiety is an emotional response. Anger is a strong feeling, uh, feeling of hostility. Those who cannot control their feelings respond with anger. Depression is unresolved anger. Um, if a patient can't um, resolve the situation, then they've lost control. The loss of control leaves them um, unable to control things and they become depressed. So consequences of failed adaptation, um, stress-induced organic responses, which is continual stress, repeated CNS stimulation, elevation of certain hormones, and results in long-term changes in body systems. So for continual stress, uh, this brings about long-term changes and additional stress and disease. Um, so think of it as being, um, you know, you have a 65 year old gentleman who comes in who has had, um, you know, a high profile job for the last 20 years with a lot of stress and um, a lot of um, maladaptive behaviors of, you know, well, let's say it's smoking and drinking and, and eating bad food. Um, the stress themselves will actually lead to ulcers or abdominal problems. So the continual stress, you've got um, the long-term changes of the body system and eventually your body just can't adapt to it anymore and, and that's when you get um, ulcers and lifelong pro other problems. So there's um, somatoform disorders and there's also stress-induced uh, psychological responses. So with somatoform disorders, you have uh, the hypochondriacs. This is a person that is preoccupied with the idea that he or she will become seriously ill um, and concerned with their health interprets real um, or imagined symptoms unrealistically. So um, you, it's, you'll have patients who will look up stuff on WebMD and go, well, I've got that symptom and that symptom and that symptom, so I must have cancer, um, when in fact they really don't. Uh, somatization um, is the uh, disorder that includes anxiety and emotional turmoil that are expressed in physical symptoms, loss of physical function, and pain that changes uh, location often. Um, you've also got the, um, the pain disorder. This is um, an emotional pain that manifests physically. Uh, pain is the main focus of the person's life. You have malingering, um, which is different from other disorders uh, because it's a con conscious effort to escape unpleasant situations. So it's um, like being invited to a party and at the last minute you don't want to go, so you pretend that you're sick. You have uh, stress-induced induced psychological responses. Uh, you've got the crisis, you get the burnout and the post-traumatic stress. Um, with burnout, um, this is really big with nurses. Um, it's the inability to effectively cope with physical and emotional demands um, of being able to do the job. Um, this is for people who have been doing nursing for let's say 10, 20, 30 years and they just physically can't do it anymore. So stress reduction interventions, um, health promotion activities, promote adequate nutrition, help the client establish a routine that includes regular exercise, teach client importance of getting seven to eight hours of sleep per day, which is interesting because I don't think any of us do that. Um, encourage participation in leisure activities, help clients to manage time, balance, um, and prioritize their tasks. Advise clients to avoid maladaptive behaviors such as excessive alcohol, caffeine, sweets, smoking, and drugs. And uh, use of specific interventions to relieve anxiety, uh, whether it be anger management, stress management, um, or you know, change the perception of their self. Um, you could also change the perception of the stressor. Um, you know, some people think that what they're going through is the end of the world and they just can't believe this is happening to them when in fact it's really something very small. Give it a little bit of time and it will really go away. Um, so it's more perception. Identify the use of support systems, use of spiritual support, uh, crisis intervention, and use of proper referrals. So for a clicker check, the nurse should assess every client to determine if stress reduction interventions should be part of the plan of care. The rationale for this action is there are more per, uh, persons experiencing mental illness now than in the past. Life is so much more stressful than it has ever been. The occurrence of stress in clients is unpredictable and clients often develop maladaptive coping strategies.
And your answer is going to be C. The nurse recognizes that all clients um, respond differently to healthcare interventions. Therefore, it is important to assess every client's level of stress to determine if interventions are required. So I think with uh, this question, it's really asking you uh, to assess everyone individually because as we've mentioned in previous PowerPoints, um, every patient you come in contact, every person you meet on the street, everyone is just different because we've all been through different experiences. Uh, those experiences are are what makes up who we are, and we just adapt them differently. So um, you can't just put people in one big group and, and, and treat them as such. You really just have to treat the individual and treat them independently. So here's your critically thinking. Um, let's see here, review the scenario of Gloria and John, uh, which is meet your patients. In volume one, um, how much does it really tell you about the client situation? Uh, which aspects of stress do you have the most information about? Uh, what facts do you have about the patient's emotional and behavior responses? Uh, what information do you have about how well they are coping with the stress? And what data do you have about their support systems? What information do you need? So then the PowerPoint, uh, bring to class whatever questions you have, and uh, we'll do some in-class uh, activities, and we'll go over this a little more in detail. So I will see you in a little while. Thank you.